This is the complication of diabetes mellitus total represented by the USA Shorts in my reference, chemical pathology lectures not of the University of Cape Town by George Van der Waard et al. So here we are going to continue with, in the first tutorial that we have seen on carbohydrate metabolism and diabetes mellitus, we have seen um, the, the carbohydrate metabolism and we have seen one complication of diabetes that was diabetic ketoacidosis. So here we are going to visualize the next complication of diabetes which is hyposmolar non-ketotic state. In hyposmolar non-ketotic state, it usually presents with a coma. Is it is called diabetic coma and is characterized by a severe hyperglycemia, which is going to result in dehydration and often a lot a worse than the DKA. Here you need to know that the characteristic of the hyperglycemia is going to be greater than 600 mg per deciliter, and then the that's why in this patient you're going to have a severe dehydration. Is it clear? But usually you don't have any ketosis in this patient, you have no ketoacidosis, so it's developed. In elderly type of two diabetic who uh, who have a who have enough insulin, so here there is insulin in the patient to prevent ketone formation. But in this city, they have insulin in their body to prevent ketone formation. But the insulin is resisted is it clear? at the level of the receptors. There is insulin resistance in this patient, so insulin does not act at the level of the receptor to cause the low level of the glucose, but the insulin can inhibit the ketone production at the level of the liver. I understand it. So, it is explained by the differential sensitivity of the ketogenesis and gluconeogenesis. So, as that is, so the major complication here is going to be a severe dehydration. And since there is severe dehydration here, it means that what? It needs to know that the glucose is going to be extremely high in the extracellular fluid. Is it clear? Since there is high glucose in the extracellular fluid, it's going to make that what? There is a shift of fluid from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. Is it clear? Since there is a shift of free from intracellular free to extracellular free, the first symptom that this patient of of this type of dehydration with hyperglycemia have, the symptoms that they usually first have is due to see symptoms of, of cerebral dehydration. Is it clear? And the symptom of cerebral dehydration constitutes constitute of symptom of cerebral dehydration constitutes of Number one, we have agitation, we have confusion, and we have coma. That's why this patient may present with coma. Is it clear? Now, the blood pressure of this patient is not going to be low. The blood pressure is going to be very high. These people are dehydrated, but their blood pressure is going to be very high because the glucose that is inside the blood is going to make sure that the extracellular fluid, including the blood plasma, resulting to the high stroke volume, is going to make sure that the blood pressure of this patient is high. So the blood pressure of this patient is going to be high. There's going to be, uh, and there's going to be high. There's not going to be any tachycardia here. So there's not going to be any tachycardia, no tachypnea. There's only high blood pressure uh, uh, and, and all that with the, the coma. Is it clear? So because the extracellular fluid is maintained, but the intracellular fluid is shrink. Is it clear? <clears throat> now, the, you need to know that also as the, 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 the glucose is being lost in urine, so this, the, as there is hyperglycemia, glucose is being lost in her urine, the patient also has polyuria. And that polyuria is shrinking the intracellular fluid more than the intracellular fluid. That's why the symptoms of hyperglycemia first start with the symptom of, of, of cerebral dehydration. Is it clear? Now, thromboembolism is going to be increased by hyperosmolarity. Is it clear? And therefore, anticoagulation is required. So every time you have a patient, sometimes in patient with um, honk, you have hyperosmolarity. So an hyperosmolarity may result to thromboembolism. Is it clear? You need to know that what there is a major ion which is used in formation of clot, and that ion is called calcium ion. It is plays a clotting factor four, and calcium ion can involve in the formation of clot, and it's also one of the molecules that is going to be involved in the hyposmolarity of the blood in diabetic, uh, in, in hyposmolar non-ketotic state, is it clear? So we have, that's why you have thromboembolism in this patient. The next state is a state of hyperlipidemia in diabetes. So you can have a state where you have hyperlipidemia in diabetes. The question is why? So you need to know that lack of insulin is going to cause uncontrollable lipolysis. Is it clear? Normally, insulin was causing glucose conversion to the fatty acids, and that's going to result to a high level of 
um, manolyl um, acid is it clear so high level that that's how glucose are now no in this case you when you have no that's how insulin acts on it in this case when there is no insulin the adipose tissues are going to release the free fatty acids is it clear so the triglyceride formation is not going to be the triglyceride formation is not going to increase and there's going to be the breakdown of the, the the triglyceride to produce free fatty acids is it clear now once they are the free fatty acid enters now the liver the free fatty acid has two possibilities the first possibility is that you can have better oxidation to produce ketones at the level of the liver when the free fatty acids are present at the level of the liver there is mostly better oxidation which occur but when the free fatty acids are present at the level of the uh, are present at the level of the the muscle cells it is mostly alpha oxidation that occurs to produce energy the liver is there to transport the molecules such that other part of the body can produce energy from the molecule that they are transporting is it clear so we have better oxidation here is going to produce ketone bodies or we have also another method as re-esterification to triglyceride and then packaging of those triglycerides which are transported now to the adipose tissue as very low density lipoproteins so now why the ketogenesis now predominate so so why ketogenesis predominate in one patient who lack insulin causing low level of maronin coa needs another one in two in type 2 diabetes re-esterification pathway is going to occur are you understanding in type 1 diabetic patient where there is no insulin the beta oxidation is going to predominate immediately there is um, inhibition of fatty acid because you need to know that what insulin normally act at the level of the the adipose tissue to cause to prevent uh, um, lipolysis is it clear since insulin is is resisted or is not present it means that what there is going to be excessive lipolysis that's going to produce fatty acids now the fatty acids now are going to move into blushing into the liver in the liver you have two fits the first fit is better oxidation of the two the ketone bodies and the second fit is gas division to produce triglyceride and packaging to very low density lipoprotein that can go back to adipose tissue now the first fit uh, which is beta oxidation is mostly going to occur in type 1 diabetes so people with type 1 diabetes are going to have the first fit because the insulin is completely absent to cause um, um, the insulin is completely absent to cause to prevent ketogenesis now the second fit is re-esterification is it clear so the second fit is re-esterification <clears throat> and that re-esterification only occurs in cases of patients with type 2 diabetes that's why patients with type 2 diabetes are going to suffer from excessive atherosclerosis is it clear when you have a type 2 diabetes you are going to have later on atherosclerosis and then later on you are going to have hypertension is it clear so the very low dense lipoprotein by uh, removal by the adipose depends on the lipoprotein lipase enzyme requiring insulin again for its activation is it clear so the lipoprotein lipase in order for the adipose tissue to remove that um, that um, um, very low that the other for the the adipose tissue to remove the the triglyceride from the 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 lipoproteins it require a lipase enzyme which is being uh, activated by insulin but there is no there is insulin resistance in this case are you visualizing so when you have insulin resistance that that very low dense lipoprotein is going to accumulate now in blood and when it accumulates now in blood is now going to cause atherosclerosis Clerosis. is it clear so that's why you have eruptive xanthomata xanthomata can also resolve when you have accumulation of cholesterol at the level of the of the the joint of the of the tendon and you have xanthelasma where it's accumulation at the level of the eyelid and you have also atherosclerosis it can also may result also to acute pancreatitis because when there's high triglyceride in blood it can affect the pancreas 
Now, the next complication of diabetes are the long-term complication of diabetes. For the long-term complication of diabetes, you need to know that most poorly controlled diabetic patients, regardless of the type, develop retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy, basically, because there are two main types of, of diabetic um, complication. The complications are divided into macro long-term complications are divided into macrovascular and microvascular complications. Macrovascular complications is mostly as a result of atherosclerosis. Is it clear? And microvascular com um, complication is mostly um, as a result of problem of gluconeogen or gluco of, of the glycolysis. Is it clear? Now, the general pathophysiology involved in this long-term complication is the fact that what is the fact that you have um, the non-enzymatic pathway of the, the non-enzymatic pathway of diabetes and you have the enzymatic pathway in the non-enzymatic pathway you need to know that what there is going to be in non-enzymatic pathway is going to result to glycosylation when you have glycosylation of the the the, the you have when you have excessive glucose inside blood in a non-enzymatic pathway that uh, that excessive glucose is going to bind with the blood plasma protein is it clear so when the blood plasma protein binds with glucose that process of binding with glucose is called glycosylation and it's going to produce primary glycosylated proteins which are called shift bodies now the primary glycosylated proteins are going to bind now with the connective tissues to produce secondary glycosylated protein that is going to result again to another form of atherosclerosis is it clear now you need to know that what there is the enzymatic pathway in the enzymatic pathway we have the enzyme called um, the succinyl reductase so we have another enzyme um, the fructose reductase or even succinyl reductase like that that's going to convert the the glucose to fructose is it clear and when fructose fructose is more hyper or smaller than glucose and that is what is going to result now to the different disorders like um, um, demyelination reduction action potential you have things in cases of, of a neuropathy you have things like um, um, immunopathy like in a case where you have um, lazy cell syndrome and you have all that it's because of different forms of glycosylation as we've said there is retinopathy which is progressive changes in the the retina resulting to blindness there is neuropathy and that neuropathy is because of sorbitol sorry sorbitol is going to be produced and not fructose so glucose is going to convert it to sorbitol because of the enzyme um, a reductase and how they hide reductase is it clear so the glucose is going to be converted and with the uptake of inositol can be related to sugar alcohol sorbitol accumulation also at the level of the lens is going to be implicated a patient with cataract where in diabetes is it clear so that enzyme is the aldose reductase is it clear that aldose in reductase is the one that is um um, um, um is involved in the conversion of glucose to sorbitol so this is the 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 um this um, diagram so the diagram needs to know that what the enzymatic pathway of of the the cycle of of, of diabetes is that it can be conversion of glucose to sorbitol and inositol and these are very bad molecules for the body is it clear? Inositol is, a, is, a, is, with, is, is related to sugar alcohol that is required for nerve transduction. Is it clear? So we have conversion, that conversion can occur via aldose reductase to sorbitol or inositol. When sorbitol accumulates, it can accumulate at the level of the lens to cause cataract. It can accumulate, uh, and inositol can accumulate at the level of the, uh, the nerve to cause, um, um, to cause neuropathy. Is it clear? Now, glucose entry into the lens, the retina, the nerve does not require any insulin. Is it clear? So, hyperglycemia and a high intracellular glucose leads to an increased orbital that cannot pass through the cell membrane and therefore remain trapped into the cell membrane. Water accumulation occur there and then cataract with nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy can occur. That is how neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, cataract result. Autonomic neuropathy is going to result to what a postural or autostatic hypertension. Usually, patients that have diabetes have postural hypertension. You measure that with their blood pressure when they are seated or lying down is normal, but when they are when they are stood or when they stand up, their blood pressure decreases. 
you have neuropathic bladder also in this patient and you have sexual dis difficulties like impotence also in this patient now diabetic food may also result because of an, an immunopathy and also a problem of all those disorders and the nephropathy can also result this can be detected with the presence of micro albuminuria is it correct? the excretion of albumin is the amount in the amount so small to detect the routine deep sick test <clears throat> now the next is macrovascular disease is it clear so for macrovascular disease you need to know that atherosclerosis is very common in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is it clear so both are type 1 and type 2 diabetes uh, uh, atherosclerosis common this may cause coronary heart disease and may commonly be associated with peripheral vascular disease you need to know that well, generally the the arteries which are affected in cases of atherosclerosis has a mnemonic ACPIC A C P I C a for abdominal aorta, C for coronary artery, P for pupitia artery, I C for internal internal um, cerebral artery, internal um, carotid artery. <clears throat> so those are the major um, 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 arteries which are involved. So abdominal aorta for abdominal aorta there is no major pathology. Is it clear? For the coronary arch is going to result to coronary heart disease. For the pupitia arch is going to cause peripheral vascular disease. For internal for internal um, carotid arch is going to result to a stroke. Is it clear? That's why the macrovascular disease should be that. Now the next one you have advanced glycosylation end product. <laughs> The advanced glycosylation end product is occurring by non-enzymatic pathway, as I was just explaining before. When you have a non-enzymatic pathway, the, the presence of glucose in blood is going to bind to the free amino acids and proteins in blood. That's going to produce now the primary glycosylation product, which are called shift body, is it clear? And also, it can bind also with glucose, with hemoglobin, to produce um, hemoglobin A1 and fructosamine. Is it clear? So now, when after binding now to produce all this product primary, this um, H hemoglobin one can um, is glycosylated with hemoglobin. Is it clear? So the newly synthesized glucose is free and, and hemoglobin is glycosylated. Is it clear? During the red cell sequestration, now glucose now attaches to the end terminal of the beta globin chain. Is it clear? Now, when it attaches, like they can now attach now to the uh, um, you can have uh, when attached like that, you can attach now to the, the, the connective tissue, which is going to result to some form of, of, of um, hemolysis and also going to result to another form of atherosclerosis. Fructosamine is the glycosylation of albumin, it has a shorter life cycle. Is a, is a glycosylation of albumin and it has a shorter life cycle. These two methods can be used for long term monitoring of control of glucose. Is it clear? So, actually, we have two main types of. of you need to know that this glycosylated end product can be used in monitoring um, the, the long term glucose. Is it clear? You have the first end product of glycosylation can be glycated hemoglobin, which is the HbA1c. Is it clear? HbA1c actually is um, the molecule because you said that. However, here is seen that. However, some of the glycosylation products are useful in monitoring glycemia, like hemoglobin A1 and fructosamine. Those are the two major uh, molecules which can be used in monitoring glycemia. Is it clear? Hemoglobin A1 is glycosylated hemoglobin, and fructosamine is glycosylated albumin. Is it clear? Hemoglobin A1 is glycosylated hemoglobin and fructosamine is glycosylated albumin. Now, hemoglobin A1 has a longer life cycle than fructosamine. So, fructosamine can tell you that the person did not control his blood glucose for two to three weeks in time. Is it clear? Because it has a shorter life cycle. Why hemoglobin has a life cycle of one red blood cell? That is about three months. So hemoglobin HbA1c can help you to monitor the blood glucose for about two to four months. So this is about two to three weeks for fructosamine and two to four months for um, in the case of hemoglobin A1c. Now the next disorder that can occur is glycosuria. 
Now you need to know that well, glucose appear in urine either so either because one the blood level of glucose is going to be very high than the threshold as 10 millimoles per liter or greater than 120 180 milligram per deciliter. Now the next is um, if the renal gl glycosuria which is harmless is it clear you can also like you can have like glycosuria in the patient who have renal glycosuria in case where it's harmless you have also increased glomerular filtration rate in case of pregnancy you need to know that in pregnancy we have increased glomerular filtration rate that's why some pre pregnant women may have glycosuria but not necessarily have gestational diabetes is it clear? Now you can also have generalized proximal um, renal tubular defect, like in the case of a Fanconi syndrome. All those are cases where you can have um, glycosuria. Now, what are the summary of quantitative glucose method? You need to know that what glucose oxid oxidase method. The glucose is oxidized by glucose oxidase. Is it clear? Now, in presence of atmospheric oxygen to to um, gluta to glu, glu, glucanolate, glucanoctone. So you need to know that these are actually quantitative methods in order to measure the glucose. Is it clear? So these are the methods to measure glucose in blood. You can use glucose oxidase method in order to measure glucose in blood. And you can use hexokinase method in order to measure glucose in blood. So if you want to measure glucose in blood, you can use either of these methods. Is it clear? So you read, you can pause and then read each of them. The next is anti-diabetic drug. The anti-diabetic drug are generally we have insulin and we have oral um, hypoglycemic agents. So for insulin, it is the mainstay for the treatment of type one and also in major type two um, diabetes patient. Is it clear? And when you want to treat any emergency form of diabetes, you use insulin. So the initial source of insulin is clinical use of human. Is it clear? The initial source where you use from the fish and the pan and the uh, of pigs, cows and pancreas, where you inject, you 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 take the insulin from the pigs, the cow. Initially, it was like that, but now human insulin is now manufactured, uh, um, is now manufactured by genetic engineering from bacteria. At first, it was just from pigs, from cows from fish of the and all that but now it is free, which is it is manufactured now for by genetic engineering now oral agents <clears throat> you need to know that what the oral agents of um, of diabetes so now for the oral agents the oral agent consists of the sulfonylureas the other is the first oral agent and then for sulfonylureas these drugs are were discovered by chance with it was noted that the sulfonamide derived um, in case of which was used in the treating typhoid was also causing hypoglycemia is it clear it was just by chance that sulfonylureas have been has been discovered because the sulfonylureas were derived from sulfonamide, which were drugs which are used in, in in bacterial infection like typhoid fever. Is it clear? But those that when you use sulfonamide, one of the side effects was hypoglycemia, and we use that hypoglycemia now to treat diseases in diabetes. So sulfonylurea now increases insulin secretion by cloning the ATP sensitive potassium channel so what what it causes it causes the shift of potassium ion out of the cell is it clear since it causes shift of potassium out of the cell cast one is going to enter and so going to cause now the activation of the 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 secretion of the insulin is it clear now example of sulfonama uh, sulfonylurea sulfonylurea you have megletinite are related also to sulfonylurea and then amplification of insulin release is shorter and more intense with megletinite is it clear? So, so for you, you simulate the secretion of insulin. Is it clear? Now, the next one is so example of sulfonylureas include gliben, clamide, and chlorpropamide. Is it clear? So, chlorpropamide and gliben clamide are examples of sulfonylurea. But chlorpropamide is not safe for renal impairment because it can cause a prolonged hypoglycemia in patients with renal impairment. So, when you have renal impairment the chlorpropamide can result to a prolonged hypoglycemia so it is not very used there now biguanite now biguanite is going to increase in, instead more of insulin sensitivity is it clear so it, in, it reduces the insulin resistance 
and increase the utilization of insulin by of glucose by the by the skeletal muscle and even the adipocyte is it clear also going to reduce the hepatic gluconeogenesis is it clear so that is how the beginner act. an example of a beginner is going to be metformin and is frequently pre prescribed in overweight patient and going to also promote weight loss is it clear it promotes weight loss because the skeletal muscle are going to break down those it can also be, 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 be prescribed in overweight patient to promote weight loss because it prevents or the, the side effect of, of bicarbonate is by the action where it prevents gluconeogenesis so since prevent gluconeogenesis there is not going to be production of glucose all the glucose is going to be utilized at the level of the skeletal muscles so can be used now the next drug which can be used as oral hypoglycemic we have alpha glucosidase inhibitor so it's going to inhibit the enzyme that catalyzes the metabolism of carbohydrate in the enzyme resulting to poor absorption of carbohydrate is it so it can take it um, good for also overweight patient so alpha glucosidase uh, inhibitor so when you 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 eat it you take it through the mouth is going to inhibit the so it's going to the, the enzyme that catalyzes the metabolism of carbohydrate now to produce the different um, glucose is going to inhibit those enzymes. Example, you have maltase, sucrase, or lactase, all those enzymes are going to be inhibited by the alpha glucosidase inhibitor. So your carbohydrate is going to go out intact and not digested. So on digestive starch may reach the colon when it is ferment, where it is going to be fermented, it's going to result in abdominal discomfort. But that's why it is a side effect because that on digestive fat result uh, arrive at the level of colon and to result to abdominal distress. Now the next drug is um, Tia Lizolinogions. A chance in observation um, of this drug is a a clo a clobifide analog is it clear so i'm not going to speak about that it's going to cause insulin sensitivity increase insulin sensitivity now you need to know that there are new development which are in place now the next um, type of complication that occur in glycemia in, in diabetic patients hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia is characterized by ripple triad where you have where it's characterized by a sim where you have a patient having symptoms of hypoglycemia with low blood glucose level of less than 50 milligram per deciliter and which is reversed by giving glucose that is hypoglycemia now the symptoms of hypoglycemia your central nervous symptoms are usually due to ad, um, um, adrenaline related is it clear so hypoglycemia we have neoglycopenic and we have also effect of um, catecholamine release response in hypoglycemia you need to know that our symptoms of neoglycemia include disorientation mental detachment dizziness paresthesia ataxia these are the symptoms of the central nervous system where you have disorientation because of low glucose level in blood the brain does not have it so you have mental distachment change in behavior paresthesia ataxia diplopia or even can be even progress completely to um, convulsion now in place of um, um sympathetic uh, nervous and derangement we have catecholamine effects like um, palpitation we have tachycardia you have sweating you have tremors you have pallor and other now the factor affecting severity of neuroglycopenic symptoms include one we have the age is it clear so in age neonates are more tolerant and than elderly and, and the elderly are more sensitive to hypoglycemia in hypoglycemia more neonates are more tolerant to that previous glucose level symptoms are more pronounced in glucose fall when uh, if glucose fall rapidly from previously high value so you're going to have more pronounced symptoms if the glucose value fall rapidly is it clear so hypoglycemia may be classified depending it can be mild it can be moderate or it can be severe now you have other forms of hypoglycemia which is called induced hypoglycemia mostly due to drugs like insulin when it overtake insulin which causes hypoglycemia you take overtake sulfonylurea such as chlorpropamide in cases of a renal failure patient which is going to result to hypoglycemia alcohol also can result to hypoglycemia because you need to know that what ingestion of excess ethanol in the star or by by a staff patient or a malnourished surgeon may result to a profound hypoglycemia often after many hours 
Is it correct? Because our ethanol is going to impair gluconeogenesis. When you take alcohol, you impair gluconeogenesis. Is it correct? So in this patient, you are going to have hypoglycemia. Only occur in hepatic glycogen store are exhausted. Is it correct? It impairs gluconeogenesis and you are going to have hypoglycemia. That's why every time you drink alcohol, you want to eat food. Is it clear? So if you have not eaten, you may have hypoglycemia when you drink alcohol. It's good always that before you drink, you eat something. Is it clear? Before you drink alcohol, you have to eat something. Else you are going to have hypoglycemia. So it's going to impair gluconeogenesis, but it's not going to impair glycogenolysis. Is it clear? So if you have eaten before, glycogen is going to be stored in your liver and your muscle tissue and even your renal tissues. Is it clear? So by that time when alcohol comes in your system, you are now going to have you are going to have inhibition of gluconeogenesis from other sources. It can be inhibition of gluconeogenesis from protein, from lipids and all that. Is it clear? But glycogenolysis is still going to occur. Now you have acute carbohydrate intakes like reactive hypoglycemia is also another problem. You have hypoglycine and you have leucine. Is it clear? So all those are drugs that can result to hypoglycemia. Now the next disease is insulinomas. Insulinomas are, are, are diseases which are due to um, insulin secreting tumors in the beta in the ice of Langer. They are usually beta cells. Is it clear? And now we need to know that well, in these insulinomas, I'm not going to speak too much on that, but it can be associated with different main syndrome that's multiple endocrine neoplasia. Example, it is associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia um, type 1, where you have an um, isolate of Langerhan tumor, you have um, parathyroid tumor, you have pituitary tumors. Is it clear? So the diagnosis, how is the diagnosis confirmed? Is that it is confirmed by demonstrating inappropriately high insulin level of greater than 10 milli um, international unit per liter in presence of hypoglycemia. So you have hypoglycemia plus high insulin level. So if you have normally, if you have high um, high insulin level and you don't, you have hyperglycemia, it just tell you that it's type 2 diabetes. But if you have high insulin level and hypoglycemia, it tells you that you have insulinoma. So the random measurement of insulin is of little diagnostic value. Thus, it is confronted by the patient with explained um, hypoglycemia to remember that the sample of glucose. You can have insulinoma, which is one of the cause of hypoglycemia. Now, you have also non pancreatic neoplasms, which may also result, like neoplasms are going to result to secretion of insulin like growth factor 2. And insulin like growth factor 2 can also stimulate the same receptors of insulin, resulting to hypoglycemia. You have endocrine diseases, you have deficiency in any of the hormones, like. Uh, which are which which cause fasting hypoglycemia so that are antagonized with insulin to cause fasting hypoglycemia example <clears throat> if you have addison disease so like in, in lack of cortisol we see that cortisol also maintain the normal glucose level so you can have fa uh, hypoglycemia is it clear so these patients are going to have fasting hypoglycemia because normally when you are fasting you should have cortisol which is there to uh, produce some glucose you should have glucagon which is there to produce some glucose you should have um, growth hormone which is there to produce some glucose is it clear so in certain diseases like addison disease where you don't have any cortisol you can have hypoglycemia in certain diseases like pituitary damage where you have lack of ACTH um, and even growth hormone you can have also that is it where you have lack of glucagon you can have that in case due to a pancreatectomy or a chronic pancreatitis is it clear and now you can also have so if you have um, explained the predisposition of pancreatic diabetes to hypoglycemia now and make control of their blood glucose insulin difficult so you have brittle diabetes so actually, we need to know that what patients that had um, um, chronic, have that have chronic pancreatitis 
have a state of hyperglycemia and a state of hypoglycemia which are which are which are existing together and that 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 that's that those patients who have chronic pancreatitis having a state of hyperglycemia then a state of hypoglycemia existing simultaneously with each other those one are called brittle diabetes those type of patients are called the brittle diabetes why in this brittle diabetes it's a state where glucagon is not secreted and insulin is not secreted both together is it clear? it's a very huge problem because since insulin is not secreted the patient when the patient eats food he has hyperglycemia but immediately the patient does not eat there is no glucagon that is going to be secreted to increase the glucose level and the patient will have hypoglycemia so the patient is always going to have a fluctuation between hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia that is called Brittle's disease and mostly occur in patients that have total pancreatectomy or a chronic pancreatitis now hypoglycemia in children hypoglycemia in children can be divided into neonatal hypoglycemia which can be um you have first neonatal hypoglycemia the next you have nesirodioblastosis which is a persistent hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia of the infants is it clear you have due to a persistent hypo a hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia of in, of infants so in this persistent hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia of infants is mostly um, in patients who do not who have diabetes in mothers who have diabetes mellitus is it clear or mothers who are taking um, so they have persistent mothers who are taking sulfonylureas is it clear so if your mother is taking sulfonylureas drugs is it clear they can also have this persistent hyperinsulinemic because those drugs are going to result to excessive secretion of insulin from the pancreas of the child is it clear or also if a mother has diabetes where there is no production of insulin the insulin of the child is going to be hyperplastic such that the insulin from the child can also compensate that of the mother is it clear so that is called nisirodioblastosis which is persistent hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia we also have the glucine sensitivity which is another form of disease we have k of hyperglycemia where some children experience hypoglycemia episode after protein ingestion because we don't forget by the fact that what there were certain amino acid that result to hypoglycemia an example of those amino acids is leucine sensitivity you have hypoglycemia after ingesting certain proteins now we have ketotic hypoglycemic in infancy is it clear so this um, relatively common cause of childhood hypoglycemia is due to failure of the skeletal model to release adequate alanine for hepatic gluconeogenesis so in this case when the patient is starving there is no and the patient has small and has proteins there is no alanine removal is it clear from the uh, from the, the 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 muscles in order for it to be converted to produce the glucose and ketone bodies is it clear so the patient is so it is in order to produce glucose is it clear so protein um, lysis is not going to occur but you have fat lysis is it clear lipolysis so since lipolysis occur normally that's why you are going to have ketosis is it clear and since the protein disease do not occur that's why you have hypoglycemia is it clear so in this case the patient is going to have ketotic hypoglycemia of the infancy now the next is glyco glycogen storage disease is it clear the glycogen storage disease is among the different type of of uh, you have glyco many types of glycogen storage disease is it clear because um, the enzyme involved in glyconolysis uh, glycogenolysis is have they, are, they have defects there are defects in enzyme involved in glycogenolysis there are different types of glycogen storage disease is it clear the first um, um, disease under glycogen storage disease, there are different types of glycogen storage disease the first disease under glycogen storage disease is type 1 and we have also type three glycogen storage disease type one glycogen storage disease also called von Gieck disease and is due to a lack of hepatic glucose 6-phosphatase is it clear the ultimate step is both glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis is it clear that, that glucose 6-phosphatase is involved in both glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis and this person lack the von Gieck this is lacking that enzyme in von Gieck disease is it clear so it means that what the patient is always always have to eat food 
is it clear in order for him to prevent from hypoglycemia is it clear and the, the, the that's the patient usually have to eat food so the patient should continuously eat um, starchy food such that he should always have glucose in his blood to prevent hypoglycemia the problem now comes in the night so that's why in the in the night like eight hours after after sleeping that's a state of fasting when this child sleep for eight hours he's already fasting in the night the patient is going to be agitated he's going to have symptoms of hypoglycemia so that's why it's as a treatment of one gate disease they is giving they we usually at night we usually give a slow releasing starchy food is it clear so that's why at night that's the, the treatment for von gate disease the next type of disease you have type 3 um type 3 um glycogen storage disease is it clear so here you have deficiency of glycogen debranching enzyme so the enzyme which is involved in debranching is not present so the affected children have hepatomegaly and hypoglycemia and still the same characteristic as type 1 of von Gehr disease other diseases here we have galactosemia galactosemia is an inherited disorder of galactose metabolism and is commonly due to deficiency of galactose 1 phosphor phosphate uridyl transferase so you need to know that what this transferase enzyme is used in the conversion of galactose to glucose since the enzyme here is lack there is going to be accumulation of galactose in the body and usually the accumulation of galactose in the body can result to mental retardation cirrhosis at the level of the liver renal tubular dysfunction at the level of the kidney and cataract at the level of the lens of the eye now the last disorder of the, the glycogen of the carbohydrate metabolism is going to be HGT fructose intolerance so in HG fructose intolerance you have an inborn deficiency of fructose one phosphate aldolase is it clear and that phosphate one phosphate aldolase converts fructose to produce glucose is it clear so in this HG fructose intolerance you have a fructosemia is it clear you have high level of fructose so here the child should not eat fruit, fruit juice it's going to inhibit gluconeogenesis so you have <coughs> So whenever the child fructose eat fructose is going to inhibit gluconeogenesis, is it can gluconeogenolysis, which is needed for phosphatase. So the sharp fructose one phosphate can lead now to hypoglycemia. So the patient has both fructosemia and still because fructose one phosphate inhibit gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, the patient is also going to have uh, 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 um, hypoglycemia so that's why this disorder is not just called fructosemia like galactosemia where there is increased level of galactose in blood in fructose in this HGT fructose intolerance you have high level of fructose that's fructosemia and also have um, that's the high level of fructose going to produce fructose one phosphate that's going to inhibit both gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis so you are going to have low level of glucose so the characteristics of HG fructose intolerance is fructosemia and hypoglycemia. So those are the two main characteristics. So from here we are finished with the first part of the tutorial. So we say thanks for your kind attention and we say we we say, don't forget to like and subscribe for our channel Science Jamaica. Thanks very much.